welcome back right to anyone who's watching this whenever it comes out uh today right there's uh, another special guest right uh, i've had on a different josh before but uh this time uh we're having on josh or as many people probably already know from twitter uh je smith right as he goes by and we're going to be going through a subject rate right, that has been pretty controversial in reform circles um to my knowledge primarily in presbyterian circles but it extends beyond that right uh even like the article that we'll be going through is from a reform baptist right i think bryce is a reform baptist um but yeah, in the reform world, there is this sort of conversation that's been going on, especially in light of the retrieval movement and in these discussions that are being had over the relationship between the reform tradition and Thomas Aquinas, right? And so uh, one of the questions that is being uh, posited is Aquinas's conception of the image of God and broadly anthropology, right? Um, in light of the fact that uh, we are agreeing with Aquinas as our tradition often has on some things, the question is being brought forward, right? Should we, should we be giving Aquinas this freedom to have this relationship to the tradition in light of what some people are arguing are very fundamental mistakes that he makes. And so first, um, I'll introduce Josh. Uh, Josh, you can tell us either about yourself or your own history with this particular subject as you've seen it, uh, and just whatever else you want to say as an introduction. Hmm. Hey, uh, everyone. I'm, my name is Josh Smith. Um, I am a, a, a father, a dad of, of three, um, and uh, a reformed uh, believer in Christ. I, I guess my introduction into this, into this issue was um, really seeing the debates that started, I think about five years ago uh, in, uh, in the raging uh, retrieval movement wars. <laughs> Um, and then seeing some debate on this, there was some pushback on some of the, the stuff that was being said about the image of God and uh, the deeper Protestant conception and stuff like that. And there was some pushback and I never saw responses or engagement. And so um, I guess this is, this is really our attempt to, to try to, you know, uh, humbly push, push the conversation forward as much as is in our power to do. Um, but um, yeah, I, uh, other than that, I mean, um, I'll toss it back to, to Edwin. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's a controversial thing right now. And so, and like you said, there, there has been some pushback. That's what we want to do. Uh, of course, in a charitable way, we recognize that this is between fellow brethren. Um, and one thing that I'll say before we move forward is that, uh, interestingly enough, so we'll be sort of engaging with this subject, I'd say broadly speaking, in terms of the overarching conversation that's been had concerning what people will refer to as the deeper Protestant conception, as it's somewhat articulated by Voss and, and Bob Inc they are referred to, um, but most especially as it's articulated today, um, using those sources in uh, figures from the Reform Forum, or of course, obviously here with Bryce Brigham. Um, and interestingly enough, our pushback, it is, it is somewhat so broad that it is on the one hand pushback to other Reformed individuals who are pushing this deeper Protestant conception. And then on the other hand, it is also somewhat of a broad response to some of the claims of um, 
Roman Catholics and occasionally the Eastern Orthodox as well about certain accusations such as the covenant of works being Pelagian, right? And so you kind of have these two different criticisms on opposite ends. And we're kind of arguing that both are mistaken in how they understand um, this area. And so, yeah, we'll be giving our thoughts on it as to why that is, right? Uh, and then obviously just more um, narrowly speaking, uh, we will be specifically responding to an article on the subject. So first I'll say, um, that is what this subject really is or the purpose that we have. What this is not, um, just for clarification, this is not a sort of um, sectarian defense of Aquinas because I think that some people may get the impression and maybe not even from us, but from others, that a lot of individuals who wish to appropriate Thomas in the tradition uh, may have these sort of um, these reactions uh, just to sort of defend their guy, right? To defend Thomas, not because they think that he is being misrepresented or misunderstood, but just because we have sort of built this camp, right? And we don't want to see our camp or our guy get attacked. And so it should be noted that that is not uh, the purpose that we have here, right? We can disagree with Aquinas elsewhere, but we do genuinely believe that Aquinas is being misunderstood and by extension that our own tradition is being misunderstood as a result. Right? And so that should be first and foremost. And now, um, now I can just give the floor to Josh, right? And you can go through your initial thoughts on making, because a lot of the issues here concern um, definitions that aren't always being agreed on or might be a little vague. And so you can just go through um, your own definitions or your own introductory comments about the subject, the terms that are being used, the concepts that are being hinted at um, before mm -hmm. we actually get into the article itself. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. Uh, I wanted to make a just a quick comment and, and agree with what you said there about um, I, the thing that, and, and we'll get more into this, I think, when we start going into the article, but the important thing here, um, especially with with uh, Brother Bigham, is that he's, um, with some of these critiques, in I think in haste to critique some perceived excesses of the, you know, so-called retrievalist movement, there's an overreaction that kind of ends up attacking the, the reform tradition itself, but claiming to be uh, acting in service of the reform tradition. And that's really, like this, I, I see, it's kind of like a first, a first um, kind of comment on that, and and just a, a display of that. But more more about that later, perhaps. But so to start, um, there are several ways to approach what we're about to talk about, and we have to skip uh, so many things that we'd like to talk about before in order to get into the article on time. But uh, kind of boiling down things um, in a certain way, I think will be useful. Uh, for the later discussion and for future discussions as well. Um, there's a common threefold division in the Reformed tradition of the image of God and man. And it consists of um, first uh, nature as antecedently or materially the image of God. Uh, then there's rectitude, a rectitude of nature, which is the formal aspect of the image of God and man. And then the third is dominion and some add immortality here. Um, which is uh, the image of God consequently. Uh, and I should say, I think in substance, um, those who use this distinction, uh, for example, uh, Macobius and uh, Turretin, and as two examples, they will, um, they're substantially in agreement on that, but I, because um, they'll both, I believe, put immortality uh, in connection with dominion and with 
um, the kind of overflowing of the image of God uh, into the body and then man's rule over uh, the rest of the creatures. But um, we, uh, those first two parts, nature and rectitude, uh, constitute as someone like Ames will put it, the intrinsic aspect of the image of God, while the third part belongs uh, to what he calls the extrinsic aspect. And we'll focus really on the first two uh, or the intrinsic part of the image, because I think um, from what I can tell, I think the controversy really concerns the distinction between nature on the one hand and then the rectitude of nature or lack thereof on the other hand. And so as for the first part, uh, which can, which is nature, um, the, which is antecedently um, the image of God, uh, when we're defining nature, we're, we're primarily concerned with nature uh, as it has existence outside of the mind and in things. So we're, um, and uh, so, well, in the physical world, there are things composed of matter and form that exist in and of themselves and not in another. These are substances, and these substances possess natures or essences. Well, we could use those two interchangeably, and we probably will in this uh, discussion. But and Aristotle has a famous standard definition of nature in Book Two of the Physics that's widely used. Uh, I've I've taken his definition and I've added some elements uh, for the sake of attempting clarity. Um, but Aristotle uh, basically says this. Uh, well, I should say this is his adapted definition. So nature is the perduring abiding principle or starting point and cause of motion and rest in a being which possesses it primarily of itself and not accidentally or coincidentally. So when we say, and to kind of uh, define some of the terms in this definition, when we say motion, we're not talking about local motion, we're not restricting ourselves to local motion, but we're talking about uh, any and all transition from being in potency to being in act or the reduction of potency to act. And when we say rest, we're talking about the end term or point of that transition from potency to act. Uh, we can also speak of nature uh, in a more restricted sense um, of a substantial form itself. Uh, and nature, uh, when used in a less restricted sense, we can also um, use it to signify the matter as well, uh, which the substantial form has uh, been joined to, is determining, and it's disposing to be acted upon in a certain way. And thus, the matter in this case is receptive to or ready for certain passive motion. If our for our purposes, uh, we could use either of these uh, but by default, uh, when we're referring to the nature, referring to nature as the image of God, um, I would imagine we're, we're talking about man's substantial form most of the time, which is his uh, his immortal soul, including its faculties of intellect and will. And then when we're speaking of nature in the context of uh, nature and grace, nature could signify only the soul, but probably most of the time. In that context, we're speaking more loosely to refer to both body and soul together, uh, which is matter and form, matter and substantial form, respectively. So hopefully the context will make this clear in each case, but I um, thought I'd, maybe I'd just mention that. Hopefully that's, hopefully that's somewhat helpful. But um, so in virtue of, of uh, what it is, if we can put it this way, a, a thing of nature is inwardly driven to pursue and to act for certain for certain ultimate end, uh, which is its ultimate perfection, and it pursues it this in accordance with and in proportion to what it is essentially and accidentally, and this is the principle of modus operandi, um, which is something we use uh, a term we use rather frequently, uh, and it's. In, in kind of common parlance, but it's a it's a technical <laughs> the where it derives from is it's a technical term. Okay, so uh, Richard Baxter has a has a helpful comment in his Catholic theology that I just wanted to read because he in, in the context of um, debates over um, physical pre motion and 
he makes a, a comment about nature and but I, this i thought this comment was was um somewhat was was quite helpful for for our purposes but so he says god doth not uphold the creature in its mere essay but in its nature which is its mobility and its principium modus or principle of nature or i'm sorry principle of motion and this nature is not only a power to action but also an incline power and so he's um baxter i, th I think this quote is really helpful with um kind of illustrating what we said before about uh a thing in virtue of what it is being inwardly driven to pursue a certain end and taking actions in order to um, in, or, in order to attain to that end. So in accordance with what we've said already and as a corollary, uh, a nature is that on account of which a thing is what it is or the sort of thing that it is. The nature is that which we signify uh, by the thing's definition um and since we're mostly concerned with man here we're gonna we can use man as an example so man's nature human nature uh we signify uh, by the definition rational animal and with regard to the genus man is classified as an animal in virtue of his possession of senses uh sensitive powers but he's differentiated from other animals having sensitive powers in as much as he is rational possessing rationality or rational faculties, which are, you know, his intellect and will. And much more is obviously man differentiated from beings that do not belong to the animal genus. Okay, and so um, accordingly, man's nature includes uh, body and soul together, as man is a composite being of both body and soul, and the body the human body is the material aspect of the, of the human that is informed by the soul and used by the soul as its instrument. Uh, and, you know, obviously bod the body has bodily parts and functions. And then the rational soul is the form of the body. Uh, and the soul is the spiritual or immaterial uh, substance, incorporeal substance that is uh, incom an incomplete substance, it's called. Because it must be, in order to have a complete human being you need body and soul not one or the other although the soul's separable from the body it, um but and then when we talk about the soul we're also talking about um all of the faculties of the soul um some of which are are um exercised through the body and we could make several more comments about this um but, but these should kind of set us up for the later discussion. Um, when we talk about nature and grace, obviously <laughs> this is the, the nature part of the nature and grace distinction. So the second part of the image of God, when we said it was threefold, the second part is rectitude of nature. And this rectitude is the image of God properly or strictly speaking. And in man, it consists of various gifts and qualities, uh, and these are all accidental perfections of the soul. We call this rectitude by name original righteousness. And to quote um, the quote Thusius, um in his he had, in the synopsis Perioris, um, which is Disputation 13, and this is Theses uh, 37 through 38. He says, by this expression, that is man is created in the image of God and according to his likeness, we mean the goodness of man, his uprightness and perfection or ideal state, his surpassing excellence over all other living creatures and his closer approximation to God. An inner integrity is found in the soul, the body, the affections and actions, and in the immortality of the whole man, end quote. And uh, to read a little bit more, he also says this about the image of God formally, about the rectitude or original righteousness of man. He says, we attribute this harmony and consensual action of all the parts of the created man to original righteousness as to a mother or a mistress. This may be called natural because it was bestowed and man received it in the sense, not of the individual, but the whole species. And because it's opposite, original sin is of corrupt nature. And that goes on. We'll 
probably read the rest of that quote later on, but wanted to at least cover that part. And I think their enthusiast is actually um, quoting a section from Thomas um, that'll be quoted later, I believe, but uh, more on that um, perhaps in, in a little bit. Um, and then uh, I had one last quote from Thusius where he says the following. He says, the apostle places the image of God viewed from its beginning in wisdom, holiness, and justice. This can be gathered also from its opposite after the image of God had been lost and from its restoration. And he quotes 2 Corinthians 3.18 and Ephesians 4.22 through 24, Colossians 3, 9, and 10. And he says, and from here comes the closer access to God, since man conforms to God and is united with and clings to him. This act, too, is expressed and embraced by the image of God. End quote. So we can, we can consider this rectitude as it exists in man's soul, and then as it subsequently overflows, as it were, to the body. Although, strictly speaking, and I, I think we mentioned this before, the human body itself is only part of the image consequent, consequently and incidentally, but it's not, formally speaking, it's not part of, of the image of God. So it's important to, to mention. Okay, so in the soul specifically, and this we, we kind of um, get into, um, there's some, there's some debates on this topic and we'll, you know, probably briefly touch on Thomas Goodwin as a, as a minority position here, right here, as I say this, I'm taking a position on that debate. And, and I just wanted to flag that because uh, I'm going to try not to, but in case I do, I wanted to flag it um, for, for later, just in, just in case, but okay. So in the soul, um, there is the image of God proper is, um, consists of an image of God proper, we call it original righteousness, consists of knowledge, uh, outstanding knowledge in the intellect, um, Genesis 2.19, uh, righteousness in the will and true holiness in the will. And it's critical to note, um, as Anthony Bur Burgess will say, when we speak of holiness, um, holiness oftentimes doesn't signify uh, a part of the soul only, but also the proper ordering and integrity um, of the whole soul with all of its parts, faculties, and this flows into the body as a result. So that's, that's significant to, to mention. So, um, to kind of break down, uh, more of the parts of, um, original righteousness or more, uh, I guess not break down more of the parts, but to describe it further. Uh, original righteousness, when we talk about that, we're, we're thinking about the inner rectitude and integrity of all of the parts of Adam, his constitution. Um, and without original righteousness, the intellect and will, in as much as they're natural, uh, we're not able to attain supernatural knowledge as to the mode or objects uh, or supernatural or um, uh, the supernatural apprehending or inclination toward uh, those supernatural objects. Uh, and these gifts um, were the source of every good work. As we can, as we go through the article, we can, we can take a look at the confessions on this. Uh, these gifts directed the lower parts, um, or low, I'm sorry, lower powers and subjected man perfectly to God. And this enabled Adam to perform all um, his works fully and perfectly uh, in, a, in a fully and perfectly good manner. Um, and his enablement by original righteousness was such that he did not require further grace beyond beyond that. Um, and this, obviously, he was mutable, so this also came with the ability to choose evil, you know, albeit under the appearance of good and forfeit original righteousness uh, by doing so. By this gift, man was perfected in nature, and his nature was uh, was elevated uh, to its supernatural goal, as uh, Gamara says. As we'll, we'll get into that quote as well, it was uh, it was it was able to exist and operate uh, in a supernatural mode and toward God. Um, 
many will say uh, man was able to live toward God in virtue of original righteousness being created in it. And this gift was, um, as we mentioned, it was mutable such that it could be lost. Um, and um, lower faculties, affections were all subject to the higher faculties, uh, to the rational intellect and will. And subjection was especially um, to the command uh, of the will. Uh, and, and then the higher faculties were subject, or the will was subject to God. Um, and headship or dominion uh, was over the ruling, uh, was over, uh, I'm sorry, uh, headship or dominion was over the animals. Uh, and man is united to God and clings to him, uh, an act which is characteristic of the image of God. And so there's this intrinsic integrity and proper ordering of Adam's faculties to one another, uh, thus properly ordering Adam with respect to his God. Um, and so that was, that's, I think, that's the image of God in the soul. Um, we could go over it in the body. Uh, there's just really quickly, um, as this overflows to the body, there's an inner integrity a body, there's a perfect subjection of the body to the soul, and the body supports and promotes the soul's actions, and it's um, in no way hindered. Oops, sorry, it's in, in, in no way hindered the soul's actions. Uh, there's the immortality of the body, uh, and um, and then through. Um, by use of the body, um, of his body, Adam had headship or dominion over the the animals. There's more we could say about this. I'm kind of kind of jumping over these, but um, so here we'll we'll argue that the rectitude is the grace part of the nature grace distinction, and I think that the um, the nature um, nature of this rectitude and whether this rectitude is accidental is where there's some concern and where we're going to run into trouble with the confessions as well as with the reformed orthodoxy depending on how we answer this question and so we thought it was was important to get into um we should mention the most basic uh, distinction between the two senses of the word grace here in reformed theology and here i'm relying on several authors such as polanus but also the theological theses of uh, louis leblanc um, as he provides a survey of Reformed Orthodoxy up to his day. It was kind of like a 30,000 feet summary. But briefly, um, the Reformed tradition has a distinction between two base, and there's more um, distinctions um, after this, but this is like kind of the most basic distinction um, between the two senses of the word grace. But grace is uh, primarily God's gracious will towards his creatures, or his favor, mercy, and love toward us, uh, such that he provides us with good things, uh, even with himself. And he provides these things to creatures, uh, which, and these things are provided not on account of merit or because it is something due to the creature. And secondly, and more importantly for this video, grace signifies the gifts that are given by God or the effects that he brings about in creatures. Um, and this is on account of that gracious disposition uh, and as a, examples, we can think of all kinds of qualities, such as infused habits of all sorts in the soul, um, which we'll get into. Um, and then uh, accordingly, when we talk about the image of God, original righteousness, this would obviously belong to the second category or the second usage of grace. Um, and furthermore, a critical note here, uh, strictly speaking, grace in this latter sense uh, signifies as we said, created effects in creatures. But the, the critical point is that, strictly speaking, this refers to things that pertain to man's supernatural end, um, which we distinguish from God's works of nature that pertain to every creature's natural end. And so that's an important distinction to make. And I think, so um, with that, that was um, what I have as a kind of a, a quick intro. I think I'm, I think I had said the will was subject to God, which is not 
false, but I, it's really the will subject to reason and reason subject to God, if I believe. If, but we'll we'll get into that. But <laughs> I think I might have misspoke there, so I just wanted to want to clear that up. Yeah, no, you're all good. <laughs> yeah, um, good stuff. And so now we can really get into the actual points that's made in this specific article. Um, again, I'll note that this response is kind of narrow insofar as it's a response to a particular article, but um, a lot of the things that Bigum is saying and a lot of his concerns are representative of a, a broader group of individuals, mm -hmm. um, right? He, he draws, I, I believe he even cites um, yeah. Wayne Tipton, uh, and I know he cites also Bobbing, but in terms of people today, he cites like he he, he cites <laughs> Lane Tipton, um, who's also a big proponent of this, right? And so yeah. our responses, I think, uh, I think they're pretty much in continuity from what I've seen. Maybe you can give your thoughts, but uh, I think um, our criticisms of uh, Bigum will be representative of our criticisms of anyone else who is uh, proposing this supposed um, deeper Protestant conception. Mm. So uh, getting to the article, um, so we won't be reading, well, at least most of the time, I don't plan on reading line by line through everything, but mm. uh, we can go through the most, well, through the sort of the points that are being made and the concerns that are being had. So um, initially, right, so the question is, right, can Thomists be reformed on the image of God, yeah, right? This is the thing that's that's being asked. And Begum, he starts off with this concern, essentially, that the retrieval movement, and if people aren't familiar with that, that the modern retrieval movement where people are going back to whether it be reform scholastics or um, medieval sources, especially that of Aquinas. Um, either way, people are going back to sources, uh, surprisingly, right, beyond uh, the, the great 20th century. Right? People, have, <laughs> people are interested. And so um, right, we are being good Renaissance men and going back to the sources. And big, um, and I've seen this concern from others as well, that the reason that some are turning to Aquinas, that reformed people or the Protestants generally are turning to Aquinas and going back to him is to combat the mistakes of some, or of, a, of a lot of modern evangelicalism. And in this case, um, Bigum, Bigum's point is that a lot of people are turning to Aquinas to combat what is referred to as theistic mutualism. Right, so first, could you give your thoughts on that, Josh? Like, do you think that this is why the retrieval movement exists? And um, what even is theistic mutualism? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I, I disagree with, with the brother here that that's why, it, that's, that that's the reason why it exists. I think people are really, recovering the theological and philosophical backgrounds of their own tradition in order to read their confessions better, you know, in order to dig into the, you know, just to dig deep in the wells of, of the folks who wrote their, um, wrote their confessions and this, their favorite systematic theologies. And then their, I mean, more than that too, but um, philosophical manuals and, and things like that. They're wanting to, to know more about that. So I think that's the wrong question. Um, it's the wrong question to which I think he gives the wrong answer and it, it's not even the right issue uh, from what I can tell. But, um, and, and I think um, it's kind of started with, with the doctrine of God um, and there's probably other things before that. Um, uh, but kind of with the retrieval movement, as we think about it, doctrine of God is, is obviously the, the most important Thing that we want to get right as as Christians um, is that that has um, implications for for the way that we worship and the way we live our life, you know, um, 
and it differentiates us as Christians from from all other all other faiths. And um, but it's not only this topic; it, it's not only focused on the doctrine of God, but it is consistent application. A consistent application would would uh, retrieve um, their forebears on, on all kinds of aspects. Um, you know that it could, and we might you know make a distinction between, and this is might be idiosyncratic, but just for uh, we want to know. Uh, we want to re retrieve in the sense of kind of gather together what our tradition is taught, even if we appropriate only some of it, you know, um, we can have a discussion about what, what we want to appropriate, you know, what's, what's best. Um, but we want to, we want to know, you know, what, what the tradition is teaching. We want to be consistent with, um, with our confessions. And it's, I think, um, so this is a very, a natural response to several problems, uh, the retrieval movement in that, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the retrieval movement is a, is a natural response to several problems in the reformed and particular Baptist context. Um, there are problems surrounding, uh, the profession of the faith and we have to revisit kind of the background of the confession. And so like kind of with that laid out, I, sorry, long winded, answer to that, but I don't, this isn't about Thomas Aquinas per se. Like, I, I think that's, that's the thing that, um, I think a lot of people are, are repeating, but it's, it's not the case, you know, cause it's, um, at least for me personally, not to go into too, too much detail for me personally, and for, ev for everybody I know, who's kind of, um, who's interested in retrieval, they were interested in Thomas because um, their research led them to see that Thomas is very important to uh, the background of the Reformed tradition. And uh, in that reading Thomas, we can understand kind of more of, and not just Thomas, but, but Thomas is, is a very important figure. But reading Thomas, we understand more of what's going on uh, in the Reformed tradition. And I think, um, sorry, one more one more comment, but it's also... This isn't. This is all in service of of advancing the Reformed tradition as well. This isn't like an antiquarian project where we're just trying to like kind of um, bring back from the dead old ideas, or for the sake of bringing back, you know, from the dead old ideas. But it's for the sake of um, laboring faithfully for Christ's church and to, to move forward to advance the tradition. I mean, if there's if there's shortcomings in the tradition, we want to advance those. We want, you know, this is, it's not just back, it's not just uh, backward looking, but it's forward looking as well. So, sorry, that was a, that was a really long winded, <laughs> long winded set of comments. Yeah, no, you're right. And I believe Bob Inc, funny enough, right? Cause Bob Inc along with Foster, the big sources um, in terms of having individuals to cite in the tradition, for this deeper Protestant conception that's being proposed. But even Bob Inc., from what I recall, says right, that Thomas does not exclusively belong to Rome, mm. right, that he and I believe Augustine and Irenaeus are um, fathers and doctors right, to whom the whole mm. Christian church has obligations. So even from Bob Inc.'s perspective, uh, everyone has an obligation to Thomas. And uh, as you said, specifically, um, the Reformed tradition does have a relationship with him that, as you said, it's it's more so that we are retrieving our own tradition. And as a result, we are retrieving mm. individuals who our tradition thinks should be retrieved. And mm. yeah, that's the point here. And then um, furthermore, he goes on to essentially discuss um, how in light of this retrieval movement and retrieving things that probably they would even agree are good things from Thomas, maybe some, um, not so much, but I'm sure they would agree that some things that he has are good. And, but their concern is that in light of retrieving the good things, we are ignoring the bad things. And in this instance, uh, the most fundamental one <laughs> is uh, Thomas's anthropology. Right, or his doctrine of man. And so his allegedly um, mm. problematic anthropology, in their view, uh, they actually 
Well, I believe uh, Yabigam here goes so far as to say that uh, the Reformed and Thomists have um, rival conceptions of the image of God, right? That's mm -hmm. how different they are. And, and even that these different conceptions of the image of God actually lead to different conceptions of God himself, which, as you just said, with theology proper is very important. And so if that's the case, uh, we appreciate the concern. And of course, we want to see if these claims actually hold up. Mm. And so, and I've also heard the other thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think that Bigum says it here, but he, he refers to backdoor mutualism. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've seen people phrase it that way or sometimes use that synonymously with saying that um, Barthianism and Thomism are synonymous. They're not synonymous. They are essentially the same. They're sort of two uh, opposite ends of the extremes to take on these kinds of issues, right? Two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Um, yeah. So first, could you explain, like, what what are they referring to when they're talking about theist, the modern evangelical problem of theistic mutualism and the yeah. opposite extreme of Thomas's backdoor mutualism? Yeah, I'm, and um, <clears throat> I think the way that Dr. Tipton explains it is that they believe that um, the path of Karl Barth and the path of uh, Thomas Aquinas start at different points, but they they converge on one another and they they lead to the same point. Um, but um, theistic mutualism broadly, I think I think James Dolezal coined that, but. What he meant by that was basically that um, that God and um, his creatures have a relationship such that there's mutual give and take that man can act upon God, you know, change him. And then God can act upon man, you know, change him. They'd probably reverse that, say God's the first actor, but man can react and then affect God. And, and then God is experiencing real change that's... Um, that's affected by the creature or that's um, affected by the creature that is. Um, and so the backdoor mutualism, did you want me to touch on that here? Um, yes, because they, okay. they often is okay. big on specifically here. We'll talk about um, this reproportioning of man's nature. Yeah. And that is, yeah. So go through the backdoor mutualism aspect. Yeah. So, so they see that, um, with people such as uh, an example would be the first one that comes to mind is is K. Scott Oliphant's um, covenantal properties in his God with us, um, where God has to take on covenant or he has to take on these these properties in order to condescend and, and to relate with uh, like kind of a, a tertium quid to relate with with his human creatures, um, and in doing that, obviously those like those properties are, are accidents. And if God can take that on and be perfected by those, then God, you know, prior to those is in potency. And then you don't have a God who's purely actual. And, um, and so that's okay. Up front, they would say that they would call that, um, I think Tipton termed this uh, front door mutualism. So it's, you have your, your kind of reciprocal, um, uh, I guess, um, man affecting or god affecting man man affecting god you have that up front and then backdoor mutualism they see in thomas aquinas uh, with thomas's doctrine of habitual or or uh, sanctifying grace um and um they and, and tipton will often say deifying grace which is um which is not a, a wrong term or anything like that but he he says it that way in order to <laughs> emphasize um that through deifying grace, since man is elevated and transformed and, and participates in the divine life, now he, it, it, and this is kind of gray, so I, I don't want to misrepresent anybody here, but it, it, it almost seems like they think that man, you know, man becomes God, not just in kind of the, the classical patristic sense, you know, but they think that man um, becomes God in the sense of like a, a like he's absorbed into God. Like that, some of the comments kind of sound like they, 
like that's how they view it. And and this is what Bryce will kind of get into. So I'm I'm actually a little unclear on what they think here, but it, it's basically they think that that um, the elevation of the creature above his nature is um, is compromising the creator creature distinction. And that's what they mean by well, this does, this is backdoor mutualism because man, the creator creature distinction is is done away with, and now man is it's almost like the uh, well let me not spec you sorry let me <laughs> it's it's unclear and i want to be careful here and, and i'm open to correction if i'm um if they want to clarify their position but but yeah they see it as backdoor mutualism because it's not obviously presenting that um kind of reciprocal affecting and being affected between god and creatures but yeah and uh like you said sometimes certain terminology will be used it's not incorrect but it's being used in a way that is questionable i i think i feel the same way about um when they will bring up divinization because sure you know i don't think there's anything wrong with that word but i think that mm. what's concerning yeah. is what they think that means you're right exactly yeah you know um and that's before moving on to the next point that brings up another thing to mind which is that some in on some of these issues i am not really sure where the lines are being drawn because some things i don't know if if they would just disagree with the fathers or um for instance as we'll be getting into this deeper protestant conception that um often the language that's used right is the man needed nothing else adam needed nothing else but a covenant Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, this is not <laughs> saying that Adam needed grace or some kind of aid um, is not unique to Thomas or even the medieval period. Right. That is something that Augustine himself mm -hmm. says. I'll probably mm -hmm. put this quote up here. Um, that, that's something that Augustine himself says of Adam before the fall. And likewise, as we'll be getting into, there are some differences. There are some different opinions. Um, within these medieval schools concerning the details about what they believe concerning the donum super additum, where we think mm -hmm. that they are conflating Aquinas' view with the view of someone like Scotus. Um, and of course, in this instance, right, it is Aquinas that is being targeted, right, as if this is his view. And so that's something to keep mm -hmm. in mind. Sometimes I hear this referred to as the deeper Catholic conception. Sometimes mm. I hear it referred to as, as the Thomistic conception. So I'm not, some clarification on that would be helpful because I don't know if they view those as synonymous, like Thomism and Catholicism, because it seems like it a lot of the time. Um, mm. But that, that's not the case, right? So I would be interested in seeing that. Um, but anyways, um, th those are his introductory comments and concerns, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and moving on to what he actually oh, views. Are we going to say something? Sorry, I, I just want to make one comment about, I, I think Dr. Tipton, um, <clears throat> he did make a distinction when he was reviewing, in, in his course on uh, the Trinity, uh, the Trinitarian theology of Thomas, he made it. He did make a distinction between Thomas and Scotus, but I'm not exactly sure what exactly um, amounted from that in, in his distinction. Not to go too much into that. I just wanted to, just in case anybody saw that course, I, I want to mention that he did. He did make a distinction there, but uh, yeah. So he sees some sort of this. He sees some difference. Um, right. I'm not convinced that it's. I don't think it's adequate the way he addressed it, but I'm not, but again, I'm not exactly sure. And I asked for clarification. So hopefully we'll, we'll get that at some point, but I just yes. wanted to get, be fair. Not that, not that you weren't being, not that you weren't fair. I just wanted to, just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. Cause I haven't seen that yet. Um, but now getting into Bigum's understanding of how, and this is the other thing, I guess, Maybe you could also clarify in this. I don't know if they see um, the view of Aquinas with just the view of all Thomists. Maybe that's the case. 
but that's how it's referred to here. The Thomist conception is kind of just used synonymously with Thomas's position. But uh, getting into it, uh, he starts to talk about how the Thomists view it. And first and foremost, um, what are your thoughts on right, his comments about image and likeness being distinguished right, in Thomas um, and saying that Adam was made in God's image, but that he was ultimately to be ontologically reproportioned into the likeness of God mm. by a special act of grace. Yeah. Uh, so I think with that first, um, in that first paragraph, uh, so he, I guess one uh, prefatory note, I don't think he cites Thomas in, in that first, uh, I don't think he cites Thomas in that first paragraph, which I thought was unfortunate. I think he, he cites, uh, I think it's Spezzano. Um, and we'll we'll get into the reproportion thing more in, in a little bit, but I think as far as uh, Thomas does distinguish image and likeness, but I don't know if it's it doesn't seem like it's the way in which it's being asserted here. Like I feel like that distinction, he's making the distinction do do a lot of work against Thomas, because um, so for Thomas, the image of God primarily signifies the conformity of the created intellectual nature to God. And to quote Thomas, he says, he is most perfectly like God according to that in which he can best imitate God in his intellectual nature. That's from uh, the Summa Theologiae, the first part, the question 93, uh, article four uh, in the response. And so, um, and then after this, Thomas distinguishes a three, uh, a three um, I guess it gives a threefold way, threefold distinction in which the image of God is in man. He says the natural aptitude for understanding and loving God among all men. And then the second, an imperfect habitual knowledge and love of God by grace. And then third, a perfect and a perfect knowledge and love of God and glory. So it's basically nature, grace and glory. There's like an like an elevation uh, in the way in which um, man is said to be the image of God. And then so likeness, uh, he says, signifies a broad conformity of man to God. And thus is less perfect than image in this in that specific sense of the term likeness. Um, and an image image uh, can also almost be thought of as a species of the genus of likeness. But then in another sense, likeness is more perfect than image in the second sense of likeness. And, and in this sense, likeness also signifies the perfection of the image regarding its conformity to um, we might say the exemplar or archetype, which is God. And so Thomas can say uh, the following, and this is from that same, this is from Article Nine, um, response to Objection One. Um, so he says, likeness is not distinct from image in the general notion of likeness, for thus it is included in image. But so far as any likeness falls short of an image, or again as it perfects the idea of image. So he's, it's, I, I think, and I'm not sure if he cites Voss or where he's getting that from, but it's almost like he just says, well, image of image and likeness are just like separable they're, or they're just like, he doesn't really nuance um, the relationship between the two in that paragraph. Um, and also, I think another note about that is he, there's some ambiguity concerning the terms nature and grace, which he, I don't think he defines anywhere in the article. Um, and it seems to imply that the issue with Thomas and with um, with Rome today is that original righteousness is not a part of the essence of man, which kind of we can see more of this in the next paragraph. But that's that's really that's like a key thing that we we need to be talking about when we talk about the deeper Protestant conception and, and, and just the image of God in, in um, among not just reformed, um, not just in reformed orthodoxy, but just Protestant orthodoxy in general. Um, so with, with our Lutheran uh, brothers and sisters too, we, we have to be talking about um, what's the, what, what do today, what, what do Protestants today think the debate is about original righteousness? 
Like, do they think that, and do they positively think that original righteousness is part of the essence of man? Or is, so that's, that's a question that, that I still have about this. Yeah, because as, as we've been discussing it, there, there are different senses in which one can understand something like natural. Uh, like, what do we mean by natural? What do we mean by supernatural? And I, I don't really ever see any discussion on what is meant by natural. And it, it's like, of course, we don't want to make any unjustified assumptions. But oftentimes, the way that natural is being used here uh, does hmm. sound problematic, right? Um, and so moving on to the next paragraph, right? They, he goes through, as you said, like, Original righteousness being an accident pertaining to the nature of the species, um, not as caused by the principles of the species, but as a gift conferred by God on the entire human nature. And that's him quoting Thomas. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and so he said, he goes on that in this conception, something that um, Tipton will also say, right, religious fellowship with God is not. A natural quality and so grace was needed to elevate man for religious fellowship even before the fall and as i said earlier right their mm. conception uh, presumably begums as well since this is tipton's position as i've seen it thus far that this is incorrect because adam needed nothing but a covenant right and so could you get into like some of the things that he's saying in this paragraph where he's sort of criticizing this this um error that thomas makes of of um religious fellowship not being natural to man whatever that means right yeah um yeah it's it's confusing to me because in the in the in that first paragraph so just to pick out some of the stuff like he says for example quote um Man was created in the image of God, but lacked by nature the ability to attain unto the likeness. Man must depend upon grace of upon the grace of God in the donum superadditum, or the added gift of original righteousness. As Gearhardus Voss described the system, only by something that raises him above his created nature does man become a religious being able to love, to enjoy God, and to live in him. And then a little bit further down, he says, um, uh, but this was bestowed on him by the donum as a special act of grace, accidental and non-essential to the nature of man. So I don't, it sounds like he, they're objecting that. It sounds like they're, they're disparaging the fact that original righteousness is, is an accidental perfection. And by implication, it sounds like they're saying, well, it needs to be essential. And, and I, I really want to ask, like, is that what the deeper Protestant conception teaches? Now, this isn't this is not Lane Tipton writing this article. So there's a difference between, you know, maybe leaders of, you know, kind of a position or those those articulating it and then those uh, kind of downstream who are who are following. So I want to make that distinction. I don't even if this is what he's saying, that doesn't necessarily apply to, to Dr. Tipton. Um, and I think um, I'm not sure what as far as the quote. I'm not exactly sure uh, about is about original righteousness being an accident pertaining to the nature of the species. Then it says it's not caused by the principles of the species, but it's a gift conferred uh, by God on, on the whole human species. I'm not sure what's converse, what's controversial about that. Um, given that, I mean, we talked about nature and rectitude at, at the beginning, but rectitude, uh, when the reformed tradition talks about rectitude, like that's an, that is an accidental perfection in man, which is the formal aspect of the image of God. Like that's what, when we talk about image of God in the strict sense, that's what we're referring to is this, this um, set of accidental perfections. Um, in this section, in, 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 in this section, Tom is saying that original righteousness doesn't belong, like a, original righteousness isn't, isn't, um, identical with the human soul. It's not part of what, uh, part, it's not one of the parts that con that together kind of constitutes us as, as um, 
human beings. Uh, it's not a, an aspect of the essence of God, or essence, I'm sorry, excuse me, essence of man. Um, and that section is a key one. I mean, we've, um, I've had that, I had that marked up <laughs> long before I read this, like long, long, long before I read this article, because that, the way that he puts that um, is excellent. And it's also kind of loosely quoted in the Reformed tradition. Uh, by I think enthusiasts, if I remember correctly, but um, but I think note that explicitly in Thomas's quote, um, he explicitly says that man was created in original righteousness. He explicitly says that in which the first man was created is the quote. So um, I think it's important to point out because I'm not sure if it's being implied here by the author that um, Thomas teaches that man was created in a state without original righteousness. Because so, that's kind of at times, and, and Dr. Tipton said that before in, a, in an inter, in an, um, a talk that he gave, he said that. But later on, and I think in this most recent class, he he clarified he doesn't think that. So, but I don't know what what Bryce here is um, if that's what he's suggesting. Um, but the, so all this to say, the author seems to think that original righteousness needs to be a constituent part or a consequent property of man's essence. And he seems to think that the Reformed Orthodox thought that this was the case, which is, um, he's, he wouldn't be alone there. There's, there's, there's many, there are many um, people who have written that um, about those outside of the Reformed tradition writing about the Reformed tradition who assert that about just, I think, Protestants in general. But um, if the author's point is that original righteousness is not essential to Adam, uh, then, oh, sorry, lost my place here. Sorry, if the author's point is that original righteousness uh, is not essential to Adam, then this position is absurd because it means that uh, it means that man is not man without original righteousness, right? So, um, like, if if he thinks that original righteousness is part of the essence of man, then the loss of it would mean that man is, you know, Adam and his posterity differ in, you know, in essence, they're different creatures. They're, you know, we're no longer humans or Adam was, you know, like we're that, and that's, that's the position of, um, of, uh, is it Illyricus, Flaccius? Illyricus, I think is the first, is his first name, but that's the, the Lutheran theologian who taught that when man fell from the image of God, um, or I'm sorry, when man fell from original righteousness, um, he lost his substantial form and took on the image of uh, image of Satan, which is, you know, different, different substantial form. So he's a, he's a different creature, uh, differing from man, according to essence. And so and that, that was universally condemned by um, by universally condemned by all. I don't um, I. Yeah. So I don't think anybody, anybody anywhere affirms that. Right. To my, yeah. to my knowledge. Yeah. And there's some, um, as per usual, right, there's some quotations from Bobbink about uh, this, this criticism of this conception wherein grace is not merely mm -hmm. restorative by an elevation and completion of nature. Uh, he also goes on, right, also referring to the donum, super additum. Um, that in the Thomas conception, Christianity may also still be a religion of redemption, but preeminently, it is not a reparation, but an elevation of nature. It serves mm. to elevate nature above itself. That is to, as I said earlier, divinize humanity. Um, but what does that mean? Like, that's the question here. Uh, and mm. you also got into like, also, and could, uh, for those who may be unaware, um, He's referring right, to the donum super additum. So, could you briefly sort of explain uh, what is the donum super additum and what is the donum concreatum? Yeah. So there's this. Um, so that I want to be want to be careful here because I I don't know um, what exactly Dr. Tipton and what uh, Bryce are arguing that it is. 
you know, because so basically in both of the, in, in there's a discussion about, well, is there a difference between these? Is there, um, like, are they compatible or what's going on here? Um, but typically they're, they're presented as, um, questions about how, uh, nature and grace or how the way in the manner in which Adam was created in grace. And so the donum super additum now, and this, this, sorry, to back up a little bit, also the the reformed do have a dis, have a disagreement with certain aspects of of the roman catholic tradition on or the the uh, some medieval strands and then some early modern roman catholics on this um but that's not the same not the same thing as what tip what dr tipton and what um and specifically what, what bryce is saying here so there's i guess um I kind of want to maybe, I guess I should ask you, Edwin, which, I guess, which one should we maybe go into like what, uh, what um, is how they are typically presented? Because I, I think there's a, there's a sense in which when we talk about the donum super additum, there is a, um, there is a debate to be had that's a legitimate debate, but I don't think this, I don't think what these guys are talking about in the deeper Protestant conception comes anywhere near that real debate, if that makes sense. Sorry, Adam. Yeah. I guess like th there's a lot to say there with that. No, no. Yes, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I guess for now, um, the best way to approach it would just be to sort of elaborate on how it's typically presented and mm, maybe okay. where. Okay where some misunderstandings could arise from how it's typically presented, maybe make some qualifications, right? Because uh, okay. those are not often made, but they are important, so. Okay. So I guess really roughly, um, the way that it's typically, the way that it's typically presented is that Adam, uh, when he was created, um and then placed in the garden and then when he was created he um that maybe he was created in a state of of pure nature with no kind of positive um positive habits or d dispositions and that he was affected by uh concupiscence um by the the warring of uh, his lower powers against his will and and that he needed some kind of extrinsic, um, some kind of supplement in order to rein in concupis the concupiscence that was in him that was, he had a tendency toward um, gratifying the flesh. And so that, God, you know, either in, either temporally God added, uh, either after a period, sorry, either after a period of um, this purely natural state, then God, you know, maybe he merited he merited this first grace by some sort of work that was congruently uh, meritorious. And then God added that to him as a result. And then the, in the fall, he lost that and returned to basically the state of pure nature. You know, there's that. That's typically, I feel like that's the mo probably the most popular way that that's presented. Um, and then maybe in this discussion specifically, but then the the other way that that's kind of presented is that well Adam was and and I want, I really want to be careful here because I don't actually that's kind of what I'm fuzzy on is how they understand this but um I guess that uh, Adam was created um, with temporally with the the gift of original righteousness uh, he was created in grace but such that if he were to fall from it, that his, it, the nat the supernatural gifts are separated from him and his nature is totally unaffected by the fall. So in both, they would say, well, nature is totally unaffected by the fall in, in these, in these views of the donum super additum. And, um, and so that was, that's, I, it sounds like that's what would, uh, because it's super added in, in this specific sense that they're saying, um when it's it's extrinsic when it's removed adam's nature remains the same 
Um, and then I think I think they see the donum concretum as well. Man was created with, and maybe I shouldn't speak on that, but the, the, I I don't see adequately how they've distinguished between. Well, let let me let me take that back. Let me take let me give it a, let me give it a crack. I think they would see well, man's. I'm sorry. I think they would say man's created with original righteousness uh, in the donum concretum. And when he falls from original righteousness, then his nature is affected, right? But I don't think they think that that the donum in that case is supernatural. Like the, it doesn't it doesn't enable um, Adam to perform acts that are uh, outside of the sphere of the natural order and above the nature of every creature. It doesn't. It doesn't enable him to do anything that he couldn't do without his natural powers, but it's somehow related to his natural powers. And but somehow you can lose it. But so I, it, it sounds like it's a, it's accidental. But with the comments above, he sounds like he's saying it's essential. So I'm I'm really confused actually by this. So hope, hopefully that's not a jumble. <laughs> but there's there's another there's some. I guess with one one quick comment about that. Um, several so many things that we can say here but i part of the confusion here too is the term super added um like thomas uses the term super added for for natural accidents for supernatural for for supernatural um for grace you know it's just a supernatural accident if we if i can say it that way so it's very it's confusing what they mean when they say it. it's super added it's super added and and that's i think that term is um has a lot of freight packed in fact in it that I'm not sh exactly sure what it means to what it means to them. But um, Jacob Wood, um, in his "To Stir Wrestles Heart," makes a comment on this. Um, but he, that's basically what he says. Um, and yeah, sorry, you to say something that wouldn't. Yeah, no, no, and that that is um, and that's helpful because it gets to sort of the points that. Are often made. Um, Bigger makes it. I've heard it elsewhere before, right? That this dichotomy between man and original righteousness, as they perceive it, um, results in some externalist development of yeah. um, the Roman Catholics and specifically their view. It serves as like a basis for their views of um, the sacraments. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen that pretty common as well. Um, but yeah, he, he just goes on to sort of. I know he gives the quotes from, like you mentioned earlier, uh, he gives one from Spazano. Uh, he gives one uh, from Thomas. And, and and then he kind of, he goes on more into this uh, later, but he, he gets at this, um, he starts hinting at this conception of um, the beatific vision, right? Um, and so I'll, I'll directly read from him, right? He says, in the Thomist conception, Eternal blessedness consists of seeing God in his essence within the intellect of man. In order for this to take place, man must be ontologically elevated or reproportioned in order to see God and enjoy religious fellowship. Again, notice that this grace is not only necessary because of sin, but it is necessary first because, and this is key, right, from their view, it is necessary first because of an inherent deficiency in human nature, right? So they, I've seen this as a common characterization of, of Thomas's view and just the mystic conceptions in general, that, that they do this where they, um, they posit some kind of inherent deficiency in human nature, right? God made man good, but according to Thomas, right, allegedly, um, there was still some inherent deficiency. Uh, he, he still needed his nature to be elevated. So do you have anything to say maybe on that, on this this notion that that Thomism posits an inherent deficiency in man, in human nature, and that that is why um, it needs to be elevated? Yeah, I. that's a good question because I don't, he doesn't, 
I'm looking at that. I don't think he cites anything. Does he cite anything from Thomas? I think they cite the passage from Thomas that says, well, and I might be confusing that with the article from Dr. Tipton, but um, does he cite the, it's about uh, the goods of nature with um, the essence and then original righteousness and then natural virtue? Here, yeah, I don't I, believe so. Here he just cites Thomas um, with reference to the notion that Man cannot attain happiness by his natural powers. Okay, is that? And then it, I think in the in the paragraph, um, actually, I think so. Going up a little bit, um, and the, he quotes Spezzano as well in the paragraph above that. I think where he says, right. "Man and um, uh, so you." I think you just you read that. Okay, I found the quote. Sorry. Uh, not only are the natural powers of the intellect and will incapable of attaining supernatural beatitude on their own, but also human nature as their source is itself radically insufficient, ontologically underproportioned for eternal life, and so incapable of producing the acts necessary to get there, end quote. Okay, so, so all right, so that's, that, that's specifically what they're taking issue with, what he's taking issue with. And I think the thing, what, what the critique really boils down to is that and it sounds see it's more complaints and negative other than than um it is positive it seems like their critique is more negative than it is positive so what i'm about to say it, it kind of is is um trying to i'm trying to read between the lines and see okay they're critiquing this so therefore they're holding the opposite so if i'm wrong in my assumption here then i you know i'm open open to correction from the 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 deeper protestant conception advocates but it sounds like the it sounds like the complaint is that by man's natural power so man qua man in as much as he is man that by man's natural powers um he cannot act uh in order to attain eternal life you know in order to attain to the vision of god that that's what it sounds like uh, is that how you understand it too, Edwin? And and there's a lot to say and we for this, but especially with the quotes that we want to share related to this. But yeah, yeah, that's how that's what it seems like to me, um, because of the fact. And like you said, of course, we we are leaving some room there to be open to correction. It's just that the way that yeah. they often speak of that which is natural and in this instance what natural powers can and, and cannot do. Uh, yes. It does seem like yeah. your description is accurate, yes. Okay, okay. I, um, I'm, I'm glad because I'm really not sure. Uh, but with since it sounds like that, um, I, I would want to challenge these guys to give an account of how they understand the metaphysics of grace. Like what what's nature on your account? What's grace? It sounds like they're totally throwing off the yoke of grace. They don't, they don't want any grace that's that's over and above nature, uh, and and elevating nature or or modifying nature at all. Um, and there's some, or perhaps any accidental forms that are coming and modifying nature. But then, what about natural accidents in that case? Like I don't, I, I guess I don't, I don't fully understand. But I think the key question here is. Do they think that one ought to affirm that human nature per se and as such is sufficient to attain uh, its supernatural end by its natural powers? I think that's the key question that needs to be answered um, in the discussion here um, between you know the different sides in this in the, concerning the image of God. And um, I'm not sure, but but I want to find out what nature being fundamentally reproportioned means to the author like there's a sense in which i don't know how they understand that but there's a you know if there's a sense in which that could be bad you know if if that meant that man lost his substantial form and took on another substantial form and that's becoming something other than human then that would be that would be highly problematic um but you know i think that's a that's not the case um you know that's not what thomas teaches that's that nobody teaches that like no no roman catholic teaches that uh or for 
you know, nobody else other than Roman Catholics that I know of, you know, teaches that. Definitely no no mainstream yeah. tradition <laughs> teaches that. But rather uh, grace per as an accident in humans perfects and elevates human nature rather than substantially altering human nature. Uh, and being supernatural grace enables man to perform acts that are not proportionate to human nature considered in itself and in, in its natural powers. Um, so the natural powers that belong to human nature can't attain, uh, can't, um, cannot, or they, their mode is natural and they cannot be, um, they, they cannot act outside of their sphere. You know, maybe that's a, hopefully that's a helpful way to put it. And that's, that's the way a lot of the Puritans will speak of it. Like, um, it's a way like, and well, well let me say that we got a ton of quotes here to to go through on that but um i wanted to make one more comment here so this is if if they would a answer that um to that key question if they would say yes that is the case that one ought to affirm that human nature per se and it's not and the natural powers are sufficient to attain to supernatural ends you know and acting and acting in a um a supernatural mode and you know i don't know how they would say that or how they would answer that with detail but that's not the reform position um and that's the that's the case we want to make here is, is it's not that um i think some people might hear some of the stuff we said earlier and think you guys are trying to you know and i hate this way of thinking but they might say you guys are just trying to uh read um like Thomas into your position or something, or th read Thomas into the reform tradition and, you know, or something like that. And that's not, not the case. And that's, we want to go through some, through some quotes about this. Um, we, we chose some kind of some representative quotes here, um, starting with Calvin. Um, okay. So the first quote that we wanted to share was, uh, from John Calvin himself. Uh, and this is from, from book two, chapter two, section 12. And Calvin says, the heading says from the editor, so supernatural gifts destroyed, natural gifts corrupted, but enough of reason remains to distinguish man from brute beasts. And the quote, and this is, these are Calvin's words. Calvin says, and indeed that common opinion, which they have taken from Augustine pleases me that the natural gifts were corrupted in man through sin, but that his supernatural gifts were stripped from him. For by the latter clause, they understand the light of faith as well as righteousness, which would be sufficient to attain heavenly life and eternal bliss. And therefore withdrawing from the kingdom of God, he is at the same time deprived of spiritual gifts with which he had been furnished for the hope of eternal life. From this, it follows that he is, so banished from the kingdom of God that all qualities belonging to the blessed life of the soul have been extinguished in him until he recovers them through the grace of regeneration. Among these are faith, love of God, charity toward neighbor, zeal for holiness and for righteousness. All these, since Christ restores them in us, are considered adventitious and beyond nature. And for this reason, we infer that they were taken away. On the other hand, soundness of mind and uprightness of heart were withdrawn at the same time. This is the corruption of the natural gifts. For even though something of understanding and judgment remains as a residue along with the will, yet we shall not call a mind whole and sound that is both weak and plunged into deep darkness. And depravity of the will is all too well known, end quote. So that's the first quote there from, from Calvin. And he's... Calvin self-consciously aligning himself with with Augustine and um, and with those who have followed Augustine um, on this point of supernatural gifts being lost, natural gifts being corrupted. Um, but notice that there's a distinction here that it's not just okay. Well, original righteousness is just you know part of man's essence. It's part of what man is. You know, it's or it's it's natural in that sense of of being of being uh, i guess essential or or i'm not exactly sure sure how they're intending natural but um 
but there's a there's a distinction that's made here. Um, we could also quote Calvin on on his commentary on Second Peter one four. That's that's quite a long quote. Um, um, let's maybe come back to that one as we as we talk about. Um, well, no, I'll I will let me read um, maybe the the last two paragraphs of that. Maybe come back to that later. Um, the rest of it. So in commenting on um, 2 Peter 1, 4, Calvin says, uh, starting the second, um, towards the end, he says, for we must consider from whence it is that God raises us up to such a height of honor. We know how abject is the condition of our nature that God then should make himself ours so that all his things should in a manner become our things. The greatness of his grace cannot be sufficiently conceived by our minds. Therefore, this consideration alone ought to be abundantly sufficient to, to make us uh, to renounce the world and to carry us aloft to heaven. Let us then mark that the end of the gospel is to render us eventually conformable to God and, if we may so speak, to deify us. But the word nature is not here, and in, in when talking about 2 Peter 2, 4, that we partake, become partakers of the divine nature, he's referring to nature in that verse, it says, but the word nature is not here essence, but quality, which is an accident. The Manichaeans formerly dreamt that we are a part of God and that after having run the race of life, we shall at length revert to our original. Um, I guess I'll... I, I think I'll actually, maybe we'll come back to that later, but I just wanted to quote that section um, as well. Like yeah, Calvin's commentary on Second Peter um, one four is that's that's very commonly used as a as an um, a text that the reform draw upon uh, to explain the doctrine of regeneration and the the starting point of sanctification. So the next, yeah. oh, did you want to quote on that or comment on that? Sorry, there's a lot here. No, no, you can go on to the next quote. Okay. Um, so the next one is from the Belgic Confession from Article 14. Um, and the Belgic Confession says this, it says, we believe that God created man out of the dust of the earth and made and formed him after his own image and likeness, good, righteous, and holy, capable in all things to will agreeably to the will of God, but being in honor, he understood it not, neither knew his excellence, excellency, but willfully subjected himself to sin and consequently to death and the curse, giving ear to the words of the devil. For the commandment of life, which he had received, he transgressed and by sin separated himself from God, who was his true life. Having corrupted his whole nature, whereby he made himself liable to uh, corporal and spiritual death, and being thus become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways, he has lost all his excellent gifts, which he had received from God and retained only small remains thereof, which, however, are sufficient to leave man without excuse, end quote. So I think you, you see this distinction again, too, that there's these gifts that, that Adam had that enabled him to, to, um, it enabled obedience to God, uh, enabled him to live live unto God, um, to commune with God, and that the loss of the that there's the loss of these things, and that loss corresponds with with uh, corporal and spiritual death. And so that's a that's a theme that's all. I mean, in the well, we uh, later on in the Westminster Confession, um, there's a that man fell from original righteousness, that original righteousness enabled him to, you know, uh, several times in the confession, it says that he was given, like Adam was given a law um, with the ability to, in a commandment with the ability to, um, to obey that. And um, when he fell from original righteousness, it says that he was disabled. So there's this ability that comes with original righteousness this accident in Adam that if he has it, he's able to obey. If he doesn't have it, he's not able to obey. So there's, this is not, um, I mean, calling it saying, um, 
that it's, you know, someone saying uh, it's, it was an accident, you know, um, an accident that was um, bestowed upon the nature, like kind of, kind of complaining about that. I'm not sure th what the source of that is and, and what the exact problem with that is because the, the confessions don't have an issue with that. Um, right. And just real quick, and speaking of the confession, uh, you mentioned enabling, right? And that's something that even like, Westminster Divine, Anthony Burgess, Burgess, how it's pronounced, um, he he notes, right, that he says that though some will not call it grace, mm. yet all they that are orthodox do yeah. acknowledge a necessity of God's enabling Adam to that which yeah. is good, else he would have failed, referring to yeah. the covenant of works. Yeah. Yeah, there's... There... Every every reformed um, orthodox view, uh, ortho, I should say orthodox reformed view. Not, I mean reformed orthodoxy, yes, but considered, you know, orthodox by reformed standards. All of those views, um, whether, uh, and I think there's really only two main ones on the on the big issues, um, which we'll get into Goodwin, but. Um, but both of those views assert that and to fulfill what God had commanded Adam to do, Adam needed needed help from God. You know, he he needed help from God. He needed, you know, like he needed some sort of uh, so he needed an ability given by God. So which is obviously if he fell from that, if that's disabled, then that's obviously an accidental state because he can't man can't fall from you know, human nature and still be man. But I wanted to go, um, wanted to choose just a few representative ones. Like Junius is a figure um, before Dort. We already, we had Calvin, we had the Belgic Confession, and now we have Junius. And there's there's a lot here. Um, so I'll, let me get started on this one, uh, start reading this. So this is from, uh, one of Junius's uh, disputations on the freedom uh, on free choice, and typically, as the Reformed will deal with free choice, um, they will deal with um, free choice as it exists in all four states of man's existence. You know, before man as created before the fall, then man after the fall before grace, and then man um, after the fall with grace and then man in glory. So they'll go through all four of those states. So he says this, um, Junius says, furthermore, this principle in the creation being right, holy, not contaminated by any stain of inordinate desires, voluntary, followed the judgment of the intellect, which could not be deceived because of the innate light of truth, in such a way that under its guidance, both angels and mankind in order, in, in accordance with, the order that is congruent to their nature and in an intelligent way were willing the ends and the objects shown by reason and performed them by acting. Although the angels acted in a more excellent way than mankind because the excellence and simplicity of their nature. For in man, even before the fall, the intellect could not raise itself by transcending the natural limits to supernatural knowledge nor could the will apprehend those things except supported and sustained by supernatural help. For this reason, to this particular principle of his nature was added, and then he uses the term superadditus, a singular principle of grace for Adam, by which his intellective will was acting, singularly moved above its natural mode. And just to pause real quick, when he says this particular principle of his nature, he's, he's really, he's talking about his, um, talking about his soul, especially, but the particular principle he's talking, he's really talking about, um, man, Adam's concretized nature, body and soul together, but, per, but especially his, his soul. So he's saying, a, um, well, let me continue a little bit more here, but so hence those words of Genesis 2, 23 announced by the prophetic spirit, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Hence also in the same place, verse 20, the imposing of names to every single animal and many other things 
which the intellect would never have been able to exert by its own insight or by the powers of its natural will. And he has some other quotes here about Adam falling from that, from that grace. So I'll skip down to um, a little, skip down a little bit to thesis 48. He says, thus it is very certain that no choice towards supernatural actions has survived in carnal man since according to 1 Corinthians 2, 11, 12, and 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and Romans 1, 7, his intellect and will do not own him naturally that choice of supernatural actions and that principle of grace, which choice being bestowed by God to our first parents in creation to compensate his, this deficiency of his nature was lost totally by sin. And so that's the last, that's, I kind of skipped a little bit there, but as you can see from Junius, um, and by the way, he's going to go on to talk about um, essential free will, free choice isn't lost or anything like that, but free choice towards supernatural actions is are lost. You know, it's, um, it's no longer assisted by grace. Um, and he talks, Junius, I know, talks about, and to my shame, I haven't read it all the way through yet, but his treatise on true theology, he talks a good bit about this. So next we have Junius is one of Junius' students, Gamarus, uh, who's our first representative from the from the Senate of Dort, um, being a delegate there. And I like Junius' treatment because it's it's or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I like Gomarus's treatment. I like Junius's, I love Junius's too. Gomarus's treatment is good because it's it's so succinct. <laughs> it's super succinct. Anyways. So this is what he says, and, and going uh, also from a disputation on free choice when he's talking about theological anthropology. So he says this, he says, these things being pre presupposed, let us now consider what a human being was able to choose with respect to spiritual matters and concerning the kingdom of God and the salvation of the soul before the fall. What it was able to choose after the fall and before conversion, what in conversion and what after conversion. Okay. So the first state, human beings before the fall were made perfectly without any stain or lack of either soul and body. And then listen to why that, why that was. This is what he says. For human beings did not only consist of soul and body as essential parts, but also of these added, super, he's the word super additus in the Latin, uh, but also of these added ornaments, namely being endowed with original justice and holiness, the soul did not only direct the lower powers and potencies, but it also perfect, perfectly subjected the human being properly and personally to God so that he was able to execute whatever God without, or I'm sorry, um, so that he was able to execute whatever God would command without additional grace. The body being endowed with immortality and a certain majesty in its ruling among the rest of the beasts, was perfectly subjected to the soul and was so apt uh, to its call that it promoted its actions rather than impeded them. As in short, there was such a harmony between all faculties uh, and parts of man that wherever the will would bend, they would adjust to it. Original righteousness perfected the soul to such an extent that as long as it remained, it was possible for the soul to perform nothing that was not pleasing to God and really good i.e. to perform perfectly good works. For it was possible for her to choose and um, choose the good and consequently live or to choose the bad, yet under the appearance of good and consequently die as happened. And then this last thesis, thesis 14, uh, Gomar says, this original righteousness, however, has been natural insofar as it not only perfected nature and elevated nature to its supernatural goal, but also insofar as it was given to man from the very first beginning. In this sense, others call it supernatural, since it did not flow from the essence of the human being. And then he ends, that's where he ends the talking about the first state of the human being. He'll go on to talk about the others. So we have, um, in addition to those, uh, two more representative, actually, yeah, two more representatives from the Senate of Dort. Um, both overlapping. The first is John Davenant uh, from the from the British delegation, and then we have the British delegation's suffrage, um, what they argued for the doctrine of regeneration. And so, um, from John Davenant's commentary on Colossians, um, from 
30, pages 32 to 34 from my edition, um, I believe it's on verse two, he says this, he says, if we understand by grace and talking about um, in uh, Colossians 1, 2, where Paul says, um, he says, grace to you and peace from, our, from God our Father. So he's talking about grace in that verse. He says, if we understand by grace the habitual gifts of holiness, it is manifest um, all these emanate from God alone to our souls. And he goes on, he quotes J James 1.17. He talks about um, the argument among the medieval scholastics about um, things, uh, created things physically operating and causing the production of grace. He, and he, uh, for arguments against that uh, among the scholastics. And he says this, he says, the infusion or the production of grace is analogous to the manner of creation in as much as it neither has any innate cause in the subject in which it acts, nor any materials by whose capabilities it might be adduced by a natural agent. He quotes Psalm 84, 12. Um, let's give it a little bit down. And then he says, grace arises out of the supernatural participation of God, but it is the work of divine goodness only to communicate himself in this gratuitous matter, manner to the, to the creature. And so this, is in, this text is important because Davenant gives a, just a broad definition of um, the doctrine of regeneration, of the infused grace uh, that the Reform talk about in the doctrine of regeneration that um, uh, he's talking about, and he's talking about grace uh, broadly, but that's the same language that's used uh, that he with the other divine British divines as part of the British delegation to Dort will use this language and in, in their suffrage when talking about total depravity and uh, regeneration. And so um, moving down a little bit, um, I'll just I will read um, kind of summarize this, but we'll be able to show this. Um, but um, from the British delegation to the Synod of Dort, from their collegiate suffrage of the divines of Great Britain, um, when they are, when the British delegation is defending the doctrine of, of what we call total depravity, you know, colloquially against the remonstrance, this is what they're arguing contra the, the Arminians. This is what they're saying. So they say this, so the will of man being fallen is deprived of the supernatural and saving graces with which it was endowed in the state of innocency. And therefore to the performing of any spiritual actions, it is able to do nothing without the assistance of grace. And then he says that the, or then they say that the will of man was endowed with excellent graces. It is hence manifest. And then they give, um, because man was made after the image of God. And then they, they go through, for example, the classical text, Ephesians 4.24. Um, and then a little further down, they say, and that such a will as this of ours avails nothing to the performance of supernatural actions. You know, and then they quote um, uh, texts such as John 15.5, Romans 5.6, 2 Corinthians 3.5. Um, and then they quote uh, Augustine. And so a little bit further, like further down uh, somewhat when they're describing regeneration um, as a part of um, what we now call irresistible grace, they go through the definition of regeneration, um, describing it as you know, it's inward and wonderful operation upon the souls of the elect, that there's this, there's this um, that they are stirred up and that there's this grace that's given to them. Um, and it creates, they say, uh, it creates uh, creates them anew, as it were, by infusing this quickening spirit and seizing all the faculties of the soul with new qualities. Um, but skipping a little bit down, um, there's some quotations where the, um, aside from their, you know, their their description, where the the British delegation is, you know, they're they're explaining with whom they're they're aligning. And they say, uh, prosper saith that grace creates good in us. And then in the next section, they say, the schoolmen do not deny so manifest a truth. Thomas Aquinas affirms that this grace of which we speak 
doth give a certain uh, spiritual being to the soul. That is, it is a certain supernatural partaking of the divine nature that it is in respect of the soul as health is in respect to the body. And it's important to note too that the quote that uh, when they reference Thomas, they cite um, disputed questions on the virtues. Um, I believe it's it's question, is it, I think it's question one, I forget, question one, article, article one. Um, but there's a distinction that's made there between the theological virtues um, and then grace as an um, entitative habit that's, that belongs to the essence of the soul rather than to a particular power. Um, and, and a lot of, you know, sometimes it's called an entitative habit. Sometimes it's called a general habit as opposed to particular. But um, that's what Thomas is talking about. And, and it's really interesting. I don't think I mentioned this in, um, in our conversations, but that section, although it's in Thomas's work, is actually, it looks like it's not from Thomas's original hand, but it's from, a, from an early 16th century Dominican who, because Thomas left, like he left, like I think 10 objections unanswered, um, that I think it's Vincent de Castro Novo, I think is his name, but he came and he added in the early 16th century responses to those objections that Thomas didn't originally add. It, it looks like because uh, several editions don't have that um, those responses. So the the sin is actually quoting a 16th century Dominican, although that's faithful to what Thomas teaches, of course. But anyways. Um, and oh, did you have anything to, that you wanted to add, Edwin? I wanted to make sure I pause after each of these. I know these are uh, nothing to add um, necessarily. Uh, of course, all these are helpful because I think one thing that I've seen and that you've noted as well is that within this, these proponents of the deeper Protestant conception, there isn't a lot of quotations from mm -hmm. the Reformed. Mm -hmm. they're, they're often citations of, as we've mentioned, Quijardus Voss, and I remember yeah. Bobby on this, but um, yeah. we don't think that the broader tradition is really being examined on, on yeah. these questions. So, of yeah. course, yeah, it's good to have all of these. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's, uh, like, and as we've, as we've been working through kind of like the 20th century guys too. I mean, I've, I've um, just a quick comment about that. I, um, I, the jury's still kind of out for me on where those guys are, are, are at. And I'm not, not everybody in the 20th century is just all bad. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of bad in the 20th century, but amongst the reform, but I, that's not to say that they are like that, but it's, there's an over-reliance on them, I, I think, here. I, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I think there's not really an engagement with the classical sources, like Edwin said. And also, the, the next quote is we, that we have is the Synod of Dort um, from the canons. Um, and specifically, we have, uh, there, like, I believe it's um, the, first, um, the first section of the um, of the canons rather than the um, response to errors. It said that there were gifts um, that were lost in the fall that were given and lost, given by God to man and lost in the fall. So those are obviously, those are accidental if they can be lost. But especially in the, you really see this come out in paragraphs two, three, and six, um, because you have these responses to these uh, remonstrant, re reformed responses to these remonstrant Arminian positions. Um, and the, so I'll read these. Uh, paragraph two says, um, you know, those who teach that the spiritual gifts or the good qualities and virtues, such as goodness, holiness, righteousness, could not belong to the will of man when he was first created, and that these therefore cannot have been separated therefrom in the fall. For such is contrary to the description of the image of God, which the apostle gives in Ephesians 4.24, where he declares that it, um, 
that it consists in righteousness and holiness, which undoubtedly belong to the will. So that's the, the first one that there's these gifts, there's these, these good qualities, um, spiritual gifts and good qualities and virtues that belong to, um, that belong to um, man as he was created that were lost in the fall. So that's, um, and when, oftentimes when the term, or when the term spiritual is used, um, spiritual, I've, I've seen, especially in the context of the writing surrounding this, surrounding the Synod of Dort, um, like the suffrage or is used interchangeably with um, supernatural. Um, but uh, going on here, um, paragraph three says, who teach that in spiritual death, the spiritual gifts are not separate from the will of man, since the will in itself has never been corrupted, but only hindered through the darkness of the understanding and the irregularity of the affections, and that these hindrances have been removed, having been removed, the will can then bring into operation its native powers. That is, that the will of itself is able to will and to choose or not to will and not to choose all manner of good which may be pre presented to it. This is an innovation and an error and tends to elevate the powers of free will. Contrary to the declaration of the prophet, the heart is deceitfully, uh, deceitful above all things and it is exceedingly corrupt, Jeremiah 17, 9. And of the apostle, among whom sons of disobedience, we also all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind in Ephesians 2, 3, and it goes on. So skipping down a little bit, uh, there's also paragraph six, those who teach that in true conversion of, in the true conversion of man, no new qualities, powers, or gifts can be infused by God into the will, and that therefore faith from which we are first converted and because of which we are called believers is not a quality or a gift infused by God, but only an act of man, and that it cannot be said to be a gift except in respect of the powers or of the power to attain to this faith. For thereby they contradict the holy scriptures, which declare that God infuses new qualities of faith, of obedience, and of the consciousness of his love into our hearts. I, and then he quotes Jeremiah 31, 33, uh, Isaiah 44, 3, uh, Romans 5, 5, um, where Paul says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. And then Jeremiah 31, 18. And so those are the, uh, just some samples from the, from the Synod of Dort. Then there's, um, we also had the Leiden Synopsis, which is an important document, or, or I'm sorry, an, an important collection of disputations, um, kind of summarizing and, um, uh, summarizing reform thought after the Synod of Dort. And it's a very, very uh, widely used text as a textbook in, in the tradition. So it's, this is, um, has, has um, authority to it uh, in the reform tradition. And so the Leiden synopsis says, and we read this quote, but I'm gonna read a little bit further. It says, we attribute this harmony and consensual action of all the parts of the created man to original righteousness as to a mother or a mistress. This may be called natural because it was bestowed and man received it in the sense not of the individual but of the but the whole species. And because its opposite original sin is of a corrupt nature. However, this does not therefore preclude every further grace of God, but it includes it so that in this way grace may foster nature. And that's the end of that. That's an um Disputation 13, Thesis 40. Um, and notice that it's interesting because this uh, enthusiast seems to um, quote Thomas here uh, on the point about original righteousness being natural or a, a good of nature, um, which is in the Summa Theologiae, the first part uh, of the second part, question 85, article one in the response. Um, and I think that's quoted by the article at some point. Um, to kind of um, I guess move through some more of these, um, I'll just summarize. Well, Libius distinguishes the gifts of God of God's image um, into natural and supernatural. Um, 
where the supernatural gifts include the rectitude of the will. Um, and he puts clearness of the understanding. Um, the, um, he puts um, other stuff like the, the conformity of the um, lower powers and affections um, to, the, to the higher um, and things like that. And that's in his abridgment of Christian divinity. Um, as for the, there's several texts in the Westminster Standards. We kind of referred to original righteousness in chapter four on creation. Um, and then in six with the fall of man, that man is created with original and four, two, that's four, two through four. And then six, two, that man is created with original righteousness, with these qualities, uh, with the ability to fulfill what God had commanded. And when he fell, he was dis he fell from that state lost original righteousness and now he's disabled right and that's what that's really what we're what we're talking about when we talk about um total depravity in the in the modern uh calvinist discourse and with provisionists and all those guys and and this also has application for his provisionism pelagian or whatever and <laughs> that's something we can talk about at some point too um but um, um, Westminster Shorter Catechism, um, questions 10 through 20, you can see that same theme. And then larger catechism, questions 16 through 29. Um, there's also talk about, I think in question 16, that part of the reason that, that um, the Son of God became man was in order to advance our nature. So that's, um, that's something we um, want to point to and, and something we need to discuss as well. Um, okay, so now for uh, our Westminster representatives, and we have so many quotes uh, from, and these are only just um, a few, but from Anthony Burgess, um, from two treatises. Um, one was uh, Vindicii, uh, Legis, and then one from Spiritual Refining. Um, I think Edwin Edwin quoted the first one. Uh, he quoted part of the first one. So that's, I'll let that one, you know, show that one and let that one stand. But um, with, um, sorry, let me put this one up. With Spiritual Refining, this work was a series of sermons that was later turned into a treatise, which is, which is pretty long quite long i think it was like i forget how many sermons though i think it was like 70 sermons or something like that um but he talks about and he kind of breaks down the nature of grace um in order to um instruct christians on how they can have assurance of grace the assurance of of that god's working in them uh, by his grace and um so there's a number of quotes here. I'm actually so I'll I'll just jump into maybe a couple of these and, and maybe we can show more of these. But um so in the very pages thirty seven to thirty eight, um uh Burgess is talking about inherent grace, uh the inherent grace of sanctification. This is what he says. He says first, he's laying out the position says first that by the inherent grace of sanctification in us we come to have a supernatural being so that as natural things have a natural being by that natural form which is in them the uh thus also the godly have a spiritual and supernatural by that infused principle of a holy life in them he quotes second peter 1 4 we are hereby said to be partakers of the divine nature second corinthians 5 17 New uh, such a regenerated man is called a new creature. And indeed, the very word regeneration or new birth supposeth a new being, not essentially, but in respect of those gracious habits and qualities which the Spirit of God worketh in him. This is this also is called the inward man, Second Corinthians four sixteen. I think it's important to 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 mention here that any time that that the reform talk about the infusion of qualities, here we're talking about. Um, one of like in Aristotle had his, you know, is, I mean, I, I'm sure probably everybody listening to this knows this, but Aristotle had his 10 categories of being that 
adequately divide created being. One was substance, the other nine were accidents. One of those nine was quality. And one of the species, the first species of quality was habit or disposition. And habit, there's habits that apply to powers, there's habits specifically, and there's also habits that apply to directly to um, uh, being, a being directly, uh, rather, and they're general, like such as health in the body. Um, and then spiritually, there's there are habits, supernatural habits, that apply to um, the essence of the soul rather than to a particular power in the soul. And they affect the soul in, um, in general. And this is part, this is actually part of, in Thomas's discussion about original sin and original righteousness, um, he talks about um, original sin being a habit in the sense that, in this sense of habit, not of affecting a particular power, but as a, as habit means like, uh, I believe he says the the disposition of a um, complex nature, composite nature, um, which is one of um, that's one of the kinds um, of that Aristotle gives as the first species of quality, uh, which is habit and disposition. Um, so, oh, and so, so skipping down a little bit. Um, Burgess says, this work of grace is that image of God in us, whereby we resemble him so that godliness is not a notion, a mere fiction, but a supernatural power, full reality. Supernatural, powerful reality, as I think in, in an older English <laughs> um, version um, is what it's saying, but whereby a man hath a new denomination of ungodly, he has become godly. Even as in natural things, by a physical motion, there is a real transmutation as of cold to become hot, or in moral things, as of a fool to become wise. Um, and a little bit further down, he says, this was upon a dangerous foundation, but we may truly say, uh, because those supernatural principles, even the image of God within the, what God once did ironically, and then he says, uh, quoting um, Genesis 3, Behold, man has become like one of us. And I think we'll get into this. So this is the image of God, that this work of grace, that's um, the, this new being in the, in the soul that affects the, um, affects the essence of the soul. And it's a new principle or it's, a new, it's like a new source of, of spiritual or supernatural life and enables all the actions that flow from it that are outside of, uh, well, and he'll get to that. So. Um, but this is, is, this is an accident. This isn't the nature of man that he's talking about. This is an added principle. It's an added quality, an added habit. Um, and so that's something to point out here in light of what we're, um, what we're looking at in the article. So I'll just, I'll read, um, he says a little bit further down, he says, secondly, inherent grace being thus in us as a supernatural pr permanent principle of holy actions, it hath therefore, as all other things have, something that is internal and co um, constitutive of it. That which is constitutive of godliness is the nature of the habits of grace, is uh, with all their particular differences as animal rationale is that which intrinsically makes a man. So this is analogous, and, and it's oftentimes habits are called second natures. Um, they because they, um, and Thomas has a really good discussion of this, and I'm, I'm trying to um, just really roughly to put it, 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 it enables a man to act in a certain way. Um, and in this case, it's that certain way is supernatural towards supernatural object. But anyway, skipping a little bit further down. So he says, um, uh, by inherent grace, we are said to live. Uh, he quotes Galatians 2, 19, 20, Romans 1, 17. And so that as natural motions discern natural life, thus do supernatural a supernatural life with this difference that to this latter, there is required also a peculiar illumination of God's spirit, Romans 8, he quotes. Uh, and then skipping, he mentions that this is a restoration and some, and skipping down actually to page 204 to 205, he talks about this being a restoration in some measure of the image of God, which he had gestured toward earlier, mentioned earlier, uh, in which we were created. Um, 
And then um, he talks about this image and likeness of God being a universal rectitude of the whole man, uh, all the parts and faculties and affections of man. Um, talks about this being a supernatural change. He says, now this image of God had these remarkable things in it. There was a, a universal harmony and proportion of all graces, for it is not the image of a man if there be not the head or the hands. There must be the proportion of the whole body. So in this work of regeneration, there must be a universal alteration. Every part must be born again, as well as every part is corrupted and every part shall be glorified. So um, that which is um, uh, those perfections of God uh, that we read about in, in scripture, uh, that we see in nature, that all of the perfections of God um, well, I should I should say those perfections of God that make um, that in or that in creaturely form make um, man to be the the son of God, you know, to be a son of God, a son in the son. Um, those things have to be um, placed in man, um, and I and he talks about that in a little a little bit further down. So he talks about regeneration being holy of mere grace he says it's interesting he he says um he says there is a uh, there's a sweet proportion between the heart that has made a holy subject and the law which is a holy object so he says first this a little bit further down he says um, first this new birth makes uh, grace to be in us by way of an in infused life and supernatural principle fixed and permanent uh, it giveth a man essay supernaturale, a supernatural being. Therefore, it is called the hidden man, the inward man, First Peter 3, 4, the new creature and the divine nature. So he's, he's not a, you know, it's, it, this is very common amongst the, like the Puritans, for example, to, um, to say uh, that in regeneration, man is given a divine, is given a divine, the divine nature, which of course they're, after a manner of speaking, it's accidental in man, what's essential in God. But um, so they compare this to it's compared to a root, to a foundation, uh, to a fountain. Um, just skipping a little bit further down. I'll just read this. This last one um, from Burgess. Um, so he says, this new creature must needs be holy of God because it is it's of a supernatural being this is on page 254 and so the operations of it do exceed the sphere of natural power that's key to what we're talking about here that these what grace enables man to do is it exceeds the sphere of natural power it's to, it's wholly above nature uh and not just i mean and they'll say this as well that um for example and i think it's can't remember the quote um, if it's from him or if it's from John Owen, although or from maybe from Goodwin. But that this it's not just that it's about man. It's not just that it's above man's nature, but it might be capable to. Uh, it might be uh, capable, or I'm sorry, an angel might be capable of doing it. But it's above every created nature to do these things. That elevates man to act above um, any conceivable nature. Um. And so he says, as when the apostles were enabled to work miracles, it was plainly a demonstration of God's power with them because they did those things which did wholly transcend any natural power, which is another example here. And there's some there's some discussion about our miracle supernatural. That's we can talk about that, too. That's not really pertinent to the discussion here, but um, they're definitely not natural. But, the you know, preternatural versus supernatural, we can discuss that. But. So he says, so when men love God, when they obey his commands out of upright and sincere motives, they're enabled to do that which wholly transcends the most refined natural abilities. It is therefore called a participation of the divine nature, Second Peter 1, 4, whereby our actions have a divine stamp upon them. And so he's, he says, um, what grace enables man to do is that which wholly transcends not just natural abilities, but the most refined natural abilities, the most, you know, the most refined natural abilities. It, uh, grace enables man to do more than that. Um, 
like wholly, it wholly transcends those. So did you have anything you wanted to, to say, Edwin? Oh, that was that was pretty lengthy. <laughs> There's sort of um, a large portion of the of our own tradition that is, on the one hand, being recovered. Some of it is already in English, so it's just being recovered in terms of people's awareness of it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, material that hasn't really been examined on this question or on a number of other subjects. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, that gets all into these questions of what it means for, say, original righteousness to be natural to man. In what sense? That's also something I've I've uh, seen quotations as well of that, where reformed offers will say. You can say original righteousness is natural in this sense, but we don't say that it was natural in this other sense. Right. Yeah. And and I have never really seen any proponents of the deeper Protestant conception make clarifications about what they do and do not mean. Right. Which yeah. righteousness was natural. Um, and that is all connected to their criticisms of, of Thomas and of others, right, about uh, doing that which is above their natural powers. Mm. And so, and so, yeah. And so big, um, in the article itself, uh, he goes through that, right. He goes through the beatific vision. Um, I don't think there should be too much to say about that since he already touched on it and on partaking of the Godhead. One thing I'll note is that oftentimes I've seen others do it as well. Um, Bigum does it where they quote, um, I believe they quote, they quote from the Westminster Standard, right, about how uh, they, they quote from the confession um, as if Thomas and or Thomas themselves uh, believe that man partakes of the divine nature by partaking of his Godhead, is language that I've mm. seen. Um, and this is not what Thomas believes, right? And this is not what mm. the Reformed Orthodox believe either. Um, so that should clear some things up in that area. Uh, you know, let it be known. Thomas does not say that. Um, Thomas does not say that we take on these sort of divine properties that diminish the creator-creature distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, we never, I believe, I forget who they quote. Um, maybe it's Van Til. Uh, I've heard, I believe I've heard Van Til quoted before about um, growing beyond our creaturehood mm -hmm. just along those lines as well. Um, all of that, and I've seen you say before, um, there needs to be some kind of syllogism uh, mm -hmm. because because these things are often claimed, but these are not things that are actually professed. So at the very mm -hmm. least, there should be some kind of evidence that that, that is what Thomas's view entails, right? Or something, right? Because thus far, it's just claims, right? Uh, and we kind of want to go beyond that. And so, but moving on to actually, yeah, they go through our Bigum goes through the Thomas view. He goes through the Reformed view, which you also already touch on because of the fact that um, a lot of those quotations right, uh, touch on what the Reformed view actually is concerning mm -hmm. this area um and i think for now um i guess all that's left to say is maybe some comments on because mm. uh, he makes we both noted there there were some interesting comments on the beatific <laughs> vision yeah right um so what are your thoughts on the beat what he says about the beatific vision uh i know he cites john owen to support him um and what he says is and it's not the majority reformed view uh I guess that's the last thing we'll get to. Yeah, I, I, about that, I didn't, like, he, he just kind of asserted that that's not the majority position. I know, I, I mean, I suppose he, I've never done a, like, a look at how many people, just like how, you know, that'd be pretty hard to do, but just to list out who believed, uh, how many people believed um, that um, an immediated vision. But it was it was odd because he said he said the majority of the tradition believes this. But then he quotes he quotes um, larger catechism question ninety as 
you know, in Watson as quoting that. But if the if the Westminster Assembly uh, formulated that, that the vision is directly of God the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit to all eternity, this immediate vision, and there's no then there's no mediation there. Like I, that was really odd because that would that would entail like and he wrote that, but he didn't explain like oh it says it's immediate, so the Westminster Assembly is teaching an immediate vision. So I don't, you know, and that's one thing that. Um, Jonathan's pointed out too. Um, but yeah, I'm not, uh, he doesn't give any citations of, um, why he says that that's the majority position. Um, and yeah, so that, that was really odd, but, um, the, from what I can tell the, um, and, uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon pointed this out that the, um, the synopsis um, a pure theology seems to teach immediate vision, um, and others have others have pointed that out. But, um, but I think, I mean, that's and and I think for Owen specifically, I mean, maybe we could maybe you know something could be done on this later. But I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that Owen teaches a mediated vision. Um, but I think he's, from what I can tell, and, and I need to really dig into that. But it seems from what I've read that he wants to maintain um like he doesn't want want the um he doesn't want christ um he doesn't want to just do away with the incarnation basically in the in in glory is what i so it seems like um to me but he says that the the beholding of the glory of christ um given him by the father is indeed subordinate unto the ultimate vision of the essence of god um I don't think he, he doesn't pit the vision of God against the vision of Christ, um, vision of the divine essence. Uh, he doesn't pit those against one another, uh, as it seems the author is. Um, but it seems he's just ordering them. Uh, not that um, we see the essence of God through seeing Christ as if, you know, but. Yeah, and after that, he just gives his own uh, brief conclusion on essentially why Thomas can't be reformed or I guess it would be it would also work vice versa why the reformed can't be Thomists on the image of God um so yeah uh just I guess as a as a brief conclusion right um Brigham and others they are concerned that the utilization of Thomas or the appropriation of Thomas in the reformed tradition uh, that there are things that he gets right, but that mm -hmm. we should also pay attention to the, that which he gets wrong, which in this example would be anthropology. Uh, we've seen it oftentimes. And that this should not be ignored, that this is the opposite extreme of modern evangelicalism, uh, which positive theistic mutualism, as I earlier stated, sometimes referred to as Barthianism, <laughs> uh, and mm -hmm. very few people like Barth. So it, it's uh, <laughs> it's really unfortunate to sort of associate Barth with Thomas in any way. But um, yes, the they believe that Thomas posits the opposite extreme of these mistakes, and of course, it's understandable why they would want to avoid this, but our concern is that their concern is misguided and not representative of what Thomas actually affirms. For future dialogue, of course, what we would like some clarification on is uh, certain things like, what do we mean by nature or natural? Because that's often the question. Um, sometimes I've seen them quote people Apart from Voss and Bavink, maybe they'll quote Maastricht or Turretin. It doesn't happen often, but every now and then you may see something like that. And the polemical question will get brought up, right? Was original righteousness natural to man or not? Um, and I won't refer to them as um, quote minds, but there, there are sometimes some quotations of reformed authors saying that original righteousness was natural to man. But... Mm. There is no 
further discussion from proponents of the deeper Protestant conception concerning what they think that that, that means from the right. authors that they're quoting from. They just kind of lay it there. And so, yeah, further clarification needs to be made about what someone means by natural, by supernatural. Um, I would also like clarification for any proponents of it to, because my assumption, I've, I've always kind of presumed that um, Tipton and others, when they say things like, did man need nothing other than covenant? This, mm -hmm. this seems opposed to what Burgess says, but I, I, I want them to sort of confirm whether or not they would agree with Burgess that, that whether or not they want to call it grace, man needed some mm. kind of aid from God to enable him, right? Um, I don't know if yeah. they reject that. It just sounds like they would when they say things like that. He needed no, absolutely nothing other than a covenant. Right, right. Because they right. use language as strong as that. And so though those are my final thoughts. If you have some final thoughts for this article itself and for future engagements with it, feel free. Oh, um, I wanted to, I, I like the way you set that up. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to ask that key question again, like what, uh, basically, we could even put it this way, like, is original righteousness essential or accidental? You know, and because if it's, if, if one wants to say it's essential, and man fell from it, then man fell from humanity, you know, man fell from his human nature, Adam fell from human nature became something not human, then we have the the flack in error on the one side. And if man, if original righteousness is essential, man did not fall from it, then we have Pelagianism, you know, and then if it's accidental, how does one escape kind of the extrinsic religious, you know, this extrinsic religious, um, extrinsic religious addition uh, accusation that's that's kind of being thrown. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I'd like to ask that. And then basically, like, how are we looking at the, I mean, the Reformed Orthodox period is the most important period of, for those who are Reformed, this is the most important period uh, for you, because this is the theology of your confessions. You know, and there's diversity within, and we didn't, you know, um, we, we alluded to, to Goodwin. Um, and if you want to, and if you want to say that original righteousness was just a natural perfection, natural accidental perfection, the, you know, um, the reward of the, and we could, we could get into this more at some point too, but the re, the reward of the covenant of works is going to have to correspond to that. Um, but there's not, um, if there's not explanation of okay, what's in man, enabling him to do what God is. Um, commanding him to do how does the reward of the covenant of works uh, correspond to that um yeah so i yeah so i guess um maybe the next step would be um for future discussions is getting into these primary sources discussing this because there's there's a very strong uh, strand in the reformed tradition or, or i think I mean, to put it really lightly, there's there's a very strong, you know, um, continuous march in the Reformed tradition of this stuff. So I, um, and maybe if they have some quotes in mind from this period, they could bring those out, but I, um, and we can just talk about that. But anyways, that's, that's yes. my thoughts, a lot more uh, than that. So yeah, and thank you for having, oh, go ahead. Ned. Sorry. Oh yeah, I was just going to say that, that, yeah, that's important because Sometimes I'm sort of confused with with what the pre-commitments here are because at times the language will seem to indicate that that which they are proposing just by the name itself, right? The deeper Protestant conception that this is either mm. the broad Protestant or the Reformed view on the subject. Um, but then at right. other times they seem very willing to admit some kind of departure from mm, the mm. Orthodox, where they are correcting these things that maybe they didn't see for whatever reason. Um, so that, that, that's also something I'm interested in. What is their stance? Because 
because we don't want to go so far as to maybe be accused of like positioning the the authority of the of the Protestant Orthodox with sacred scripture or anything like that. But right. it will be helpful if because we need to know if um, individuals nowadays are are they saying that what they're proposing is in continuity with them or is there is there a conscious discontinuity with them where they really do think that they need to correct their their mistakes and if so then then um we need to know that right, right. so yeah yeah and, thoughts. I th and i think that the state of the question too in this is can thomas be reformed on the imago day so and and i didn't even comment on the language of reformed thomism i mean we don't have to i i kind of just i mean i don't really care either way but i i feel like just for the sake of like not for the sake of avoiding headaches for everybody like we should stop using that term because that clearly makes people upset and so we, you know like right. that's, that's fine to not use that um but uh I'm, or i'm fine to not use that um but if if we're talking about you know the way this is set up is what did the reform believe and then he's like this at the end he says these boundaries were clear to the reformed like are they clear now and i'm like okay we gotta we gotta get into those into the sources if you're talking about what the reformed tradition is like we you know rather than is it true you know this this article wasn't really about oh is this doctrine true it was more so about is it reformed you know um now obviously i don't think those are separable questions but i you know just the they're distinct. Even, you yeah. know they're distinct yeah so <laughs> i get what you mean yeah um yeah well the, those are all my thoughts so uh thanks for coming on of course not many people are interested well at least not many people from what i've seen are interested in the subject and pushing back against um what is referred to as the deeper protestant conceptions so mm. well, it's yeah it's been great to have you on and to go through some of it and there's so much more that could be said but yeah oh yeah, man this is good for now <laughs> yeah. thank you for having me edwin I, i'm sorry to i'm sorry to uh man I, I was there's just so much to that that started this drone I, if i droned on you know no you're good <laughs> Yeah, well, um, thanks for anyone who tuned in, of course. Um, and, and I will likely link your Twitter. Or, yeah, I refuse to call it X. Okay. So I'll <laughs> likely link your Twitter if people want to ask you further questions. Presumably, they already know mine. So if anyone, of course, has further questions, then, yeah, that we have a lot more to say for sure <laughs> but um yeah. yeah that's the end of this video